His parents couldn't find him, but the scribes and the Pharisees were all gathered round him as a boy in the temple, speaking with such wisdom. They were all amazed at what he said, and in the middle of it all, there was Jesus, the one crying in the wilderness, John the baptizer, spoke of one who was to come baptizing with fire when John baptized him the heavens were opened and God descended like a dove and in the middle of it all there was Jesus To bring life to his daughter, he spoke with authority straight from the Father. No one could explain away his power, and in the middle of it all, there was Jesus. A man hung there bleeding He was sent for the souls of men To captives bring freedom But three days later His tomb was empty He conquered death, hell, and the grave And in the middle of it all facing no matter where you've been in hard times or in good times keep your eyes on him in the heat of the battle or by pleasant mountain streams he'll be right there in the middle that's where he's always been so be strong and take courage when you think you're gonna fall Cause right in the middle of it all There is Jesus So no matter what you're facing No matter where you've been In hard times or in good times Just keep your eyes on Him In the heat of the battle
Today I faced a mountain And once again it seemed so tall I tried to climb it But it seemed I'd surely fall So I knelt I called on Jesus Just as always I felt His presence His hand of mercy It lifted me Just in time I want to thank Him And I want to praise Him His grace has been sufficient And like before He's given victory Looking back on this journey Since the day I first met Him So many times His love and mercy has rescued me So once again I come before Him And one more time I'll say Praise Him for all His blessings. Yes, He has been so good to me. I want to thank Him. And I want to praise Him. His grace has been sufficient. And like before, He's given victory. If you got your Bible, open it with me to the book of Habakkuk in chapter number two. Won't you enjoy that good singing? Praise God. I like that line looking back on this journey since the day I first met him. It's been a few years now, not as long as some, but longer than others. And I tell you, it has been a good journey. And I can definitely say he has taken real good care of me. I appreciate the good choir singing, Brother Jared and the ladies singing excellent. And I praise God for it. Habakkuk chapter number two, Habakkuk chapter number two, and when you find your place, let's stand together. We'll read the word of God together. It's good to see some 
familiar young faces over here on my left. It's good to see these young'uns that have helped us in camp and others that are here tonight. Appreciate you being here. And, uh, man, I, I bless the Lord that he's allowed me favor with a generation that's coming behind. And I don't take that for granted that the Lord allows me to be a part of y'all's life. And uh, I thank God for it. Habakkuk chapter number two. We started last night in Habakkuk chapter one and we looked at the first five verses and there's a message I've been preaching out of the book of Habakkuk at our church for some time and I've not just got it all out of my system yet. And uh, so I just preach it till I get it out of my system. And sometimes it takes a few weeks, sometimes it takes a few months. And I have preached a message on Sunday morning and preached it again on Sunday night. You say, why did you do that? I guess we didn't get the point. There's no such teacher as repetition, amen? And, uh, I, and I have just not been able to get these thoughts out of my mind. I believe that Habakkuk was living in a day much like our day, much like our present circumstance. I believe Habakkuk was living in that kind of time. And if Habakkuk can make it through, I want to figure out how he did it so I can make it through. And uh, I tell you what, I'm afraid in our day, we're just trying to muddle our way through. And I believe there's more to the Christian life than that. I hear people say, well, it's just not the way it used to be. It may not be, but I believe there's still work to be done or the Lord would have come back and raptured the church away. And I, I, listen, I don't know that we'll ever have a, a revival in America as a whole. I, I doubt very seriously we'll have a national revival. I doubt that the state of Georgia or the state of North Carolina will experience a statewide revival. I don't even know that the county in which I live in will have a county wide revival. But I can't find a verse of scripture in this King James Bible that convinces me that we cannot have it in our local church, in our families, and in our hearts. He said in chapter three, he said, oh Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. He said, revive thy work in the midst of the years and in the midst of the years make known and in wrath, remember mercy. My, if God can do it in the day that Habakkuk was living in, I am convinced, I am convinced that God can do it in our day. I read it just before I came in. I've never read this statement. The statement said this. It said we repent enough to get forgiveness. He said the question is, do we surrender enough to be changed? Mm. Maybe I ought to say that again. He said we repent enough to be forgiven, but do we surrender enough to be changed? Amen. That's good. I wonder tonight what you would be willing to surrender to have revival in your heart, in your home. I said this morning preaching, y'all be seated, I'm going to say a few words and I'll read the Bible. I said this morning, I had the, the great opportunity and privilege to preach this morning at, at Woodland in, the, in the, the chapel service this morning for Brother Jonathan Ritchie. And Brother Jason, Brother Kenny made a statement, Brother Kenny Baldwin made a statement preaching. This is what he said. He said 78% of the children that are being raised in churches are going to leave by the time they're 20 and never come back. Mm. 
Mm. If you're under 20 years old, stand up tonight. If you're under 20 years old, under 20 years old, all you youngins, if you're under 20, stand up. All you youngins under 20, Let's just take a minute and look at this. Everybody look around. Y'all looking? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Y'all sit down. No, no, just the eight. Not everybody up, just the eight I pointed to. You two young men right there, stand up in the middle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Y'all sit down. Y'all still standing. One, two, y'all stand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, y'all sit down. You're standing up right there. One, two, y'all keep standing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can sit down. Y'all two stand up. That right there of what church as usual will, provide, will produce. Good. That right there, what going through the motions. I read something else today right before I came in. It said the greatest children's ministry is what letting our children watch their mom and dad follow Jesus. Look. You say it's not happening. Well, you better not ride with me on a weekly basis because you'll go to places that it is happening. There's churches that are missing entire generations. Preacher, I go to some places, everybody's 60 and older. There's no young people. I worry about those places because they're about 20 years from locking the door. And then I go to other places that ain't got a silver-haired folk a silver-haired person in the whole place. I worry about those places because there's no anchors in there. And I believe those places are in danger of being caught up in the contemporary movement and any, and any kind of new doctrine that rolls down because there's nobody in there that's believed anything for any time. Amen? And then I go and I see an older group and I see a younger group, but I don't see any middle-aged folk. Come on, that's good. We're in trouble. That's right, yes, sir. I know the Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail, but it don't mean the wind's not going to blow. <laughs> and I know we're not going through the tribulation. Amen. Amen. I don't care what new doctrine they've all come back up with now. They say we're going back through, going back through the tribulation, some pre post pre wrath tribulation. It's a pre tribulational rapture. Right. Amen. Amen. We're not going through one moment of that of that tribulation. Right. That don't mean it's not going to get dark before we get out of here. That's right. My thoughts and my heart at our church has been turned to those words. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Now all you young and stand back up. If you're, a, if you're 25 and down, let me get in that group. 25 and down, stand up. You think that's worth having a revival? You think that's worth praying, praying, O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. On, right. In the midst of the years, make known. My prayer for this generation is what you know about the power of God is not all of what you've heard and what you've been told. But I'm asking God to make known in the midst of the years. And in wrath, remember mercy. I don't want her little life and her little heart. All she knows about the power and the move of God is what you can tell her and what her papa can tell her. Let me see him for a minute. (laughs) 
I want to be preaching this when he is big as you are. I'm not planning on changing. But just say something to your mom and dad. If it's good enough for me to preach to my two boys, right. it's good enough for me to preach to your children. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. He's all right. Amen. But let me ask you something. If some of y'all don't know what revival's about, who's going to show him? Let's just be honest. By the time, by the time he is their age, all of our heroes will be dead. This is your nephew, isn't it? I never forget Brother Dean took his coat off and threw it at our threw it at my feet one night preaching at our place. And he said, It's our time now. He likes us to he likes to move. He he likes to preach. Boy, he's a butterball. Y'all are such hypocrites. When we're, when we're, us boys are young and fat, y'all think it's so sweet and pretty. And then when we marry y'all, y'all get all critical. You've lost your boyish figure. Well, my boyish figure looked a whole lot like that. Amen. But it says get in shape. Let me just say a word to you. Sir, I took, I paid attention in geometry. And ma'am, round is a shape, praise God. Amen. Brother Dean threw that coat down. I said, it's our turn. Yeah. But Jerry, my heroes are gone. I've got a few left, Brother Rudy, some of them older men. Preacher Moore. He wants to preach some more. <laughs> if we don't have it, who's going to tell him about it? Right. Good, brother. Amen. Amen. Some of you have been content to ride the coattails of your spiritual leaders in your family, in your church. Somewhere along the way, you're going to have to get off that coattail. Amen. Find your own ground with the Lord yes, and let God do it for you. Yes, Some of you will get happy when your parents get happy or they'll, you'll serve God. If they, but somewhere down the road, you're going to have to say, Lord, yes. though none go with me, yes. still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. There's no turning back. Amen. No turning back. Yes, sir. The world. Here we go. Here's that surrender part. The world behind me, the cross before me. Have you ever put the world behind thee and the cross before thee? The world behind thee, the cross before thee. No turning back, no turning back. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Turn your Bible to Genesis 17. I'll pick up with a back at two tomorrow night. Everybody okay? Y'all, youngins from Woodland, y'all just going to have to smile and act like this is new. You know what the word revive means? 
to live or to breathe again. You men that have pastored for years, everybody's looking for a new work. Everybody wants some new something. Let me, let me just say to you and let me remind you, revival is not a new work. Revival is the stirring of an old work. Some folk can't get revived because they never had anything done in them to begin with. You can't be made alive again if you've never been made alive in the first place. R.G. Lee said in the 1960s that 70% of the Baptist church was lost. Brother Lair, if it was that bad in the 70s, where are we at in 2019? Good night. Revive to breathe again. Genesis 17, three new names show up in Genesis 17. Man, you say, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm going to get somewhere. Just hold on. We're going somewhere. The first new name is in Genesis 17, 1. The Lord said, I am the almighty God. Amen. Thank God. He said, I am the almighty God. In Genesis 1, 1, he was, the Bible said in the beginning, God. And then Genesis 2 or 3, 4, he said he was the Lord God. And then he was just the Lord. And then in Genesis 15, 1, he said, I am thy exceeding and great reward. But now he looked at Abram and said, hey, I, I, I got one other part I want to show you. I've got a book, I've got a set of books at home by Charles Rolls. It's a book about the names of, of five or six volumes set about the names of Christ. Over 200, over 200 names of recorded in Scripture up for the Lord. You say why? Because He's so almighty and He's so wonderful and He's so big and He's so eternal that you could not contain Him in one name. You could not contain Him in one description. And thank God, can I tell you, over the last 32 years of being born again, he just keeps peeling back layer after layer after layer after layer and said, let me show you who I really am. He said, I am the almighty God. Man, he's declaring his power. He's declaring who he is. A revelation of God's power. We so in our day, Brother Jared, we are so trapped into believing in a little G, little O, little D God. We're more afraid. Can I tell you? What was it? Brother Dean said it some time ago preaching. He said the definition of fear, he said when you fear something, you, you trust in it more than you do the Lord. What you fear is what you trust more than you do him. He said, I am the almighty God. I'm the almighty God. There was a declaration. He said, I am him. I'm the one that stepped out of nowhere, peeled back the curtain of nothing, and spoke everything into existence. I am the almighty God. And can I tell you, in the day we're living in, I I still believe in a capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, a covenant keeping Jehovah God. He said, and El Shaddai. That's what that word means, is El Shaddai. You know how many times El Shaddai shows up in the Old Testament? but eight times. Uh, can I tell you the reason I've got a new beginning? Uh, the reason I got a new start uh, is because I serve uh, an almighty God. Uh, he's stronger than my sin. Uh, he's stronger than my guilt. Uh, he's bigger than my failure. Thank God I serve uh, an almighty God. Yes, amen. But then notice what he said. 
We live in a day, preacher, everybody wants to talk about rights. Don't everybody want, anybody want to talk about responsibility. You've infringed on my rights. I'll tell you what he said. He said, if I am the almighty God, i tell you what you ought to do. Look at that verse one. He said, walk before me and be thou perfect. He said, I tell you what, if I am everything I am and you are everything you are, you ought to walk before me and be thou perfect. Then you can look, I believe it's in verse three. The Bible said Abraham fell on his face. There was a revelation of God's power in that first name. Let me ask you something. How long has it been since he peeled off a layer for you? I'm afraid, Brother Jason, we're living in times where People, their Christianity is checking off boxes. I did this. I did that. I came to church. I sang in the choir. I, I don't do. Man, let me tell you. I'm, 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 a, I'm for separation and I'm from sanctification. I'm against enough to make everybody in here nervous. Amen. I mean, man, I, I, listen to me. I've been preaching at home at church and man getting to preaching and preaching against something and Miss Amy getting in the car on the way home and say, Daddy, when did we get to be against that? And I said, well, I don't know, but we are today, praise God. <laughs> Amen. I mean, every once in a while, preacher, you ought to say something about something. Amen. 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 But I'm afraid I've been around some that they measure their Christianity by what they don't do. And if that's what a Christian is, a paraplegic would be the greatest Christian you ever know because they don't do anything. Amen. And I got some checking this boxes about what I don't do. And then on the other side of the coin, I got some that are checking their boxes about I came to Sunday school, I sing in the choir, I worked my time in the nursery, I showed up to keep the preacher off my back. And that's all our Christian life really is. I wonder how many youngers, if your mom and dad didn't stay on your back, if you'd have a Christian walk at all. Preach on, right there. Yes, sir. Amen. I wonder if some of us spouses would have a walk if you thought it'd be all right with your your spouse, your husband or your wife, if you didn't, and it would not put your marriage in jeopardy. Amen. Yes. That's what our Christian walk is. That's about like having a marriage license and not kissing, praise God. (laughs) Amen. Everybody okay? Some of y'all parents just swallowed your throat right there. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Y'all see that right there? That makes it legal. Glory to God. Amen. We have no, man, if all, if all we ever did was just sit down at the dinner table and talk about what went by the day, it was never, I never got to hold her hand, I never got to, I never got to show her that I loved her. Man, what an empty relationship. And the Lord said, I am the almighty God. He said, walk before me and be thou perfect. And then he said, he fell on his face. Man, there was some adoration. Yes, it was. Yes, sir. There was a revelation of God's power. But then notice verse 5. He said, Thy name shall no be called Abram, but Abraham. So now we have more than a revelation of God's power. We have a receiving of God's power. A receiving of God's power. But the problem is we've got a human problem. Anybody know what the word Abram means? The word Abram means father of many. Would anybody care to take a guess how many children Abram had when Genesis 17 opens? One. 
and the one that he had, he had out of the will of God. And we're still battling the descendants of Ishmael to this day. The Iranians are descendants of Ishmael. All them red, hot, tempered Middle Easterns that are not the Jews, neighbor, are descendants from Ishmael. And can't you imagine when they looked at Abram and said, man, they listen, them Hebrew, they knew what names meant. Of the scripture, when they named somebody, it meant something. And don't you know when somebody said Abram, and they said, Father, many, they said, how many young did you got? And Abraham said, or Abram said, one. They said, Father of many, huh? Father of many. You know what Abraham means? Oh, Brother Mays Jackson said years ago, praise God. He said, the beloved, he said, when Abraham began to tie the Melchizedek, God hung the ham on him, praise God. That's what Mays Jackson said. I heard him say it at Harmony Street Baptist Church. Abraham means the father of multitudes. Now, Abram needed a name change. But to me, looking on the outside in, if I was been in his day and time, I'd have thought we went the wrong direction. See, the problem was this. Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 90. The human problem says, you ain't having no children. I'm not looking to start another family at 45. Can I get a witness? I'm praising God. The next young one that's going to ride in my car, in my truck, in the car seat is going to be a grandchild. Can I get a witness? Amen. One that I can send home. One that somebody else buys their groceries. Amen. You ever thought of why the Lord introduced himself to Abraham that I am the almighty God? Because Abraham had a problem he couldn't fix. And God had a promise he wanted fulfilled. So we're at an injunction. Abraham's 99, Sarah's 90. And God said, you're going to be a father of multitudes. Kings and princes are going to come out of thee, but you're an old man. But then there was a heavenly power. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham. In the English, that's two letters, H-A. To the, uh, in the Hebrew, it's one letter. You know which letter the alphabet it is in the Hebrew? The fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is what God put in Abraham's name. Mm. He just hung some grace on him. Mm. That H, that that you say, what's so important about that? That that H A that sound in the Hebrew, it's the word for breath. But the kicker is this, brother Jared. It's not only the word for breath; it's the same word for spirit. God said, I tell you what's going to take you from Abram to Abraham. I tell you what, the flesh got you. The flesh got you, Ishmael. He said, but you're about to learn what it is uh, to live after the Spirit of God. He said, I'm about to put my breath in you. I'm about to put my spirit in you. And he said, listen, you've seen the difference uh, of the difference between fruitlessness and fruitfulness is one letter, uh, and it's the breath of God. That is I wonder how many of us are sitting here tonight and if we'd be honest our Christian life is fruitless and we're listen beating our head up against the wall and you're wondering what do I need to do a preacher to have revival in my heart I tell you what you need you need the same thing that I need and the same thing your preacher needs and the same thing that Abraham needed you need a fresh breath of God to be breathed into your heart and listen, you won't have to live after the flesh. You'll be able to live after the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. 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 Saul, he hung on him. 
That's the only thing he changed. And then here come Isaac. That's the second name. Look in verse 15. And some of you are thinking, boy, you licking this candy stick. I ain't preached this but the first time Sunday night. And the Lord's helping me. Remember, verse 15, the Bible said, Sarah, she was going to be called Sarah. Nobody knows what Sarah means. There's different writers say it means contentious or mocker. But we know what Sarah means. Sarah means princess. It's only fitting if she's going to have kings and princes come out of her loin that she'd be a princess. Brother Mark, you know what God hung on her? Same thing he hung on, a- on Abraham. That, <sighs> the, <sighs> and no, I'm not a smoker. I am tempted to chew a little tobacco every once in a while, but not smoke none. Ain't no sense in us burning anything that tastes that good. Good night. I'm just kidding, kids. Don't you? Somebody goes, man, bro, Mark, chew the back. It was a long time ago. Man, we're in North Carolina, Winston-Salem of all places. Y'all just bow all y'all's head, pray God. Amen. Yeah. You know what Sarah needed? The same thing Abraham needed. Mama, you know what you need? Same thing daddy needs. That. Preachers, you know how it is, man. You've drug up in a pulpit about half dead, half mad. And God come out of nowhere and just. Years ago, I asked Brother Tony, I was talking to him. I said, how you doing, preacher? He said, Brother Mark, he said, I'm a decade tired. He said, you don't know nothing about that. He said, you just getting started traveling every week. He said, but you come back and see me in a decade and let me know. Well, Brother Jason, this year is my decade. This year I'll preach somewhere in the vicinity of 65 meetings. Most of them are at least Monday through Wednesday. About 46 of them will be 46 or 7 of them will be Monday through Wednesday. And then I'll pick up a couple of youth meetings on Saturday and Friday ever occasionally. And I'm not saying that. Listen, that's the grace of God. I'm not bragging. I deserve to be in hell. And if anybody knows me, they know that I'm not. That's not who I am. I brag. But I'm going to tell you something. There's nights when I sit on a pew, my body's war slap out. When I get up from meetings and drive four hours home to make a hospital visit and then drive four hours back to preach the next night. And I've sat there at nights and wondering how I was going to do it. And all of a sudden he come by and go. You know what it is to get up there and you man you want to sing and man you don't want to go through the motions and you wonder how it's going to happen all of a sudden. You know what I'm talking about. I wonder if we're ever really being effective if we operate without that. Here's the kicker. That first name was a revelation of God's power. That second name was the recipient of God's power. But Sarah was about to realize God's power. You say, what do you mean, preacher? She was the one that the power of God was about to work in. What about that? God touched her dead womb and brought a prince out. And God touched Mary's virgin womb and brought a king out. Yes, sir. Hey, man. (laughs) Yes. But Abraham... Got his name changed. But Mary, uh, Sarah was about to be the one who experienced 
God's power <coughs> in her body. I told him this morning at school, my youngest is about six foot tall. He weighs barely 150 pounds. He doesn't wear pinstripe suits because it have one stripe in it. I could put my finger in his belly button and touch his spine. I've never had that disease. I mean, I cough up things that weigh more than he does when I'm sick. He has got lit up a couple of times in football season this year. Our coach wanted him to weigh, in the first of the summer, he weighed 140 pounds. His, his metabolism resting is faster than my metabolism on a couch to 5K app. Can I get a witness? He gets up and goes, runs two miles just, just to loosen up. I would run two miles to go to heaven. <laughs> Amen. Miss Imogene, if you heard that I've railed over two miles, there's a really big man that's chasing me and I'm trying to get to my truck where I have a pistol. <laughs> Amen. They wanted him to weigh 180 pounds. I said, he can't gain four pounds, much less 40. He said, Dad, I'm going to gain some weight. And he bought some of that protein powder. Man, that's, that's crazy. Drink that stuff, it tastes like dirt. Man, get you a 22 ounce bone in ribeye and gnaw it off the bone. Hey. Amen. Drink that, man. God help, man, that gag of, ugh. Every, I mean, that's about the difference between reading the King James Bible and reading an NIV. I mean, man, every once in a while, if you read some other version, you might get a piece of meat. But every time you open that King James Bible, it's meat every bite you get. Yeah. I don't know what you're drinking in them protein shakes, but honey, that 22-ounce ribeye, medium rare, glory to God with the fat still on it. Amen, amen, and amen. It's protein every bite. Y'all want to pray and go to Longhorns, amen. It's called the outlaw at Longhorns. There's a place in Kissimmee, Florida, 50 ounce T-bone. It ain't just some big piece of meat. It's the real deal. If you're going there, my name's on the wall. <laughs> Woo! I ate it, two baked potatoes and an appetizer, glory to God. I'll say, well, you're glutton. Gluttony is eating past being full. I got full about the time I took that last bite. Praise God. <laughs> Glory. And Carter bought that. I'm getting back to the story. You can tell I'm not eating like I want to because every time that my fault step at church when I'm, not, I'm having to diet, yeah. that I, all I preach about is food. <laughs> Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, 8. I claim them verses. I watched him walk buy that protein powder all summer long. And he wouldn't drink it. Yeah. And I mean, that, there ain't no telling what that stuff costs because he got a 55-gallon <laughs> drum of it. Right. I mean, it's that big around. I mean, his protein powder weighs more than he does. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, man, I think the mailman got a hernia just delivering it. I mean, good night. <laughs> I'm going somewhere. And I watched him walk by it all summer long. Three years ago for Christmas, but Jared's been to our house. We've got a, a pool house that, that I put a, I've turned into a gym. I put a bench press in there and a squat rack and several bars. And it's sitting there untouched. I've tried to talk mama into selling it to her three times. She said, well, daddy, maybe they go down there and work out. He walked by that powder. I can't tell you how many times this summer they walked by that weight, weight set going to get in the pool. But he got lit up a couple of times. It's, and you understand what that means. If you don't, I'll let, that means he got rocked. That means somebody bigger and stronger than him hit him 
and he was wondering which sideline to go to. The other day, he said, Daddy, he said, I'm going to get serious about putting some of this weight on. Christian, I asked y'all this morning, Joe, y'all, been, y'all remember the creamery over there, right on the other side of camp, makes that fresh chocolate milk. I mean, you need a boat motor to stir it up. It's so thick. Amen. He mixes that protein, sh- protein powder in that chocolate milk. And this morning, he got up at 5.30 and went down in that building and started lifting them weights. See, the potential of all that weight lifting, that weight gain was on that bar and in that building all summer long. But now he's finally about to realize the benefit in his own body of what that works about. How many times are we walking in church and we're walking right by the power of God? We're walking right by the breath of God. The Lord's wanting us to realize it in our life and in our Christian walk. And we're just walking by it time after time after time after time. And God's doing his best to hang up. To hang up in our life. A lot of things will make you different. I never have wanted to be run of the mill. I don't care when I was playing football. I didn't want to be run of the mill. I'm glad I was big. Amen. Now, I found some that were bigger than me, and I found some that could give it to me a lot, but I never found one that could give it to me all night long, even if I had to cheat. Y'all pray for me. I don't want to be a run-of-the-mill preacher. But I don't want it to be the church that I pastor that sets me apart. Yes, sir. The vehicle that I drive, That's right. the clothes that I wear, the meetings that I preach. If there's anything that makes me different, I want to have that. That, that breath of God in my life. Let me ask you something, Mom and Dad. How long has it been? since your children have watched you operate in the power of the breath and spirit of God. That's good. Amen. Sunday school teacher, when's the last time you got in front of your Sunday school class with that breath of God, that fresh anointing all of the Lord? Amen. Youngin, my question is this, have you ever had it? I guess really the right question would be, adult, have you ever had it? Mm, good, right? I tell you one thing, I've had it enough to know when I don't have it. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'll preach out of Habakkuk too, not tomorrow. But I got up there looking at these young and then I thought, man, God help if there's ever been a time we need the breath of God. Yeah. Thank God for technology. Thank God for, I mean, what a building. Tongue and groove, wood ceiling. It's been, that's called pickled, is that right? White, what, whatever, it's pretty. What a beautiful facility. But if that's all we've got, we're missing it. That's right, yes sir. We're about, to, I mean, right now, we're about to spend a million dollars at home. We're about to spend a million dollars on our building right now. But if that's all we got at the end of the day, and we ain't got no breath of God on that, I'd, we'd be better off in a tent on the side of the road Amen. than Amen. to spend a million dollars without the breath of God. Amen. I'm afraid we've told the Lord, hey, we really don't need you. We got it. Our ability, our talent, our organization. I mean, I'm all, I'm all for all of that. Because the more organized we can put it together and the more organization I can put together, the more things that we can accomplish for the glory of God. How many of you go on visitation? Raise your hand. Was the last time you knocked on a door? And when you knocked on a door, 
you're talking to them people with the breath of God in your life. Choir member, when's the last time you sang with that? Yes, sir. I wonder how many of us tonight, if we walked out of here with a new name, wouldn't take much to change it, just one letter. Just one letter. I was in Moab, Utah last night, last week, excuse me, not last night. <laughs> Y'all laugh, praise God. Y'all go, I don't know half what I say where, man. Moab, Utah is where they mined uranium. And I saw those, the, the tailings of those, some of those uranium mines while I was out there. And they tell me that one gram of uranium that is converted into energy is as powerful as 20 tons of dynamite. One gram, that's about what a small candle weighs. But can I tell you, if the United States of America had been mining uranium from the time the Lord said, let there be light, they'd not have one iota of the power that the almighty God holds in his hand. Preacher, this is my prayer. I do not want an explainable ministry. I want the world to look at what we're doing and say, man, the Lord had to do that. Man, we're in the, I mean, you've got to be, you don't just happen up on our church. You've got to be coming there. But if God can do it for Larry Brown out in the middle of Iowa, right. God can do it for us. Yes, sir. My prayer's been this, Lord, with our youth meetings, with camp, our ministries of our church, Lord, give us a ministry that impacts eternity. Amen. And the only way we'll ever do that is with the... <sighs> God breathed his breath on Abraham and Sarah and God gave him Isaac. That's right. The only thing that's the difference between fruitlessness and fruitfulness is the breath and the power of God in our life. Come on, Brother Jared. That wasn't what I came to preach, but it ain't what I, I didn't come not to preach it either. We need desperately need the touch of the power of God. I believe he's worth it. That's your little feller. How old are you, buddy? Seven. You've got about 13 years left with him. Maybe 12. If he goes to college, he may never come home. He may find a mate, never come home. So you got about 12 years for him to see you follow God with the breath of God in your life. My time's almost done. I've got an old one that's 19 and a half and one that's about to be 17. My window is closing. Has he ever just said, let me help you tonight and give you a little bit of. <sighs> Boy, to the world, that H didn't seem much, did it, preacher? That H didn't seem much to all them around him, but it sure changed Abraham's life forever. When God put the H on Abram and made him Abraham. Wouldn't it be something to come out of this camp meeting? You say, preacher, that's not Jubilee camp meeting, preacher. I don't know any way other than just to preach what God puts in my heart. I wonder how different service would be tomorrow night. 
I wonder how service would be. I wonder how the choir would sound Sunday if about half of them got a... Are we repent enough to be forgiven? The question is, will we surrender enough to be changed? Wouldn't it be something? I like that old song I used to sing years ago. Touch me again, Lord. I need your power. Touch me again, Lord. Let me feel that fountain. Come, Holy Spirit. Let the heavens descend and touch me again, Lord. That's what I need. Touch me again, Lord. Let the manna fall from on high. Wherever I'm going, you've already been. So I ask you. Touch me again. I wonder how many of us would be honest. Slip around an altar tonight and say, Lord, if you don't do it for anybody else, would you just put a Jerry's going to sing. Would you mind the Lord?